Well, before we uh, get to Dynamite, let's try to get a few things here in the middle. Jim, I have an article here from the New York Post, July 24th, 2024, by Joseph Stazuski. Damian Priest's WWE rise has only just begun on Journey to SummerSlam. Quote, can't go backward. It's still so surreal to Damian Priest that he doesn't want it to end or see himself slide backward. The Bronx native won his first world championship with an epic Money in the Bank cash-in on Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania 40 to become world heavyweight champion. It's allowed the 41-year-old Priest to establish himself among WWE's main event talent while being a leader in one of its hottest factions in the Judgment Day all in the latter stages of a career that began in 2005 at Old Time Wrestling in New Jersey. So let's stop there, because that was one of the surprises to me. I didn't realize he's 41 years old already. Well, didn't we? Well, I guess maybe that makes sense. We looked up his age one time. It was like 39, but that may have been a while back. Uh, He carries it well, but... Does it help or hurt the wrestler for that to be public? Well, that's it. When he was saying the other day, you know, he like I fought on the streets for 20 years. Well, I guess you could start becoming a street fighter as an impoverished child living in in the ghetto uh, when you're 10 years old or whatever. But to actually, I think they should downplay that part. <laughs> If you have been a star for a an extended period of time, and then they talk about you having a twenty year career, that's one thing. If if, if people bring up that you've had a twenty year career, and we just heard of you fucking recently, it eh, probably not a, not a help. Well, let me go further down in this article here. Not everything has gone perfectly during Priest's reign. During a critical point late in his match against Seth Rollins at Money in the Bank, he did not kick out when he was supposed to. (laughs) But the referee, smartly, did not count to three, so he was eventually able to turn McIntyre's cash-in attempt, uh, able to turn, yeah, that is what it says, thanks to outside help from CM Punk. Priest didn't want to get into anything medical around the situation, saying it was personal, but did want to set one thing straight. Here's a quote. The idea that I forgot to kick out, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. (laughs) We don't forget to kick out. 20 years in, I'm pretty sure there is some kind of muscle memory there. So me forgetting was not the case. There was nothing outside that was supposed to happen. It was a matter of, there was a situation, but I'm okay. Everybody's fine. The story continues. <laughs> Let me stop right there. Well, that, that, is, that is that's a great way for him to put it because remember we did, we didn't say he forgot to kick out. He didn't kick out is a correct way to phrase it. But no, you don't forget. Oh shit! I forgot this wasn't the finish, even though we went over the finish for a fucking hour earlier with Drew and a blah. I just forgot. No, that doesn't happen. But and we mentioned at the time, there's things that can... When a referee goes down, especially in the old days when fans were making a lot of noise and every, you know, you worked with a lot of different referees, so everybody's different. Sometimes a guy will interpret a, a, the, the first count as, as he saw out of the corner of his eye, the referee going down and thinks he just landed on the mat or miss, and miss one misinterpret something and that's where most of that you know oh shit he didn't kick out comes from you thought it was on two or something it distracted you uh or you thought it was on one rather uh and then sometimes you get your bell rung and it sounds like didn't they do the goddamn thing where there was a superplex and then they rolled up and picked and the other guy came up and boom and down? Somebody hit the back of their fucking head, probably, or it sounded like Priest did. Well, let me just finish what it says here. He was kicking himself, that's a quote, because the moment happened 
as he and other performers strive for perfection. Any reaction to it on social media didn't bother him because, another quote, it's not real. He <sighs> said when he showed up on Raw the next night, he got a great reaction from fans. <laughs> another quote, there for the story and the big picture. It doesn't affect anything. The show goes on, and I think fans are very invested in everything that's going on. The ones that matter knew the situation, and nobody thought twice about it. Move on. <laughs> Please get off of my back. The only thing, I think it's disrespectful, even with when we're talking about Something that happened in a match that uh, the, the bone of contention here is wasn't supposed to be the finish and he didn't kick out. So that kind of tells you it's it's a work. But for any of the boys to to just come out and say things like it's not real or use the F word or speak derogatorily just that bluntly and in that fashion about the business, I still think doesn't do anybody any good because it, it it's it's not real in most people's minds. It's not far away from, yeah, that shit's easy. And that's why all these fucking jack-offs think they can do it these days. So we are downgrading uh, our own profession, but nevertheless. Well, I guess that's really it. That's the uh, crux of the stuff in the article here that I wanted to ask you about was just the idea of what happened there. It sounds like if we're doing basic deduction, probably had his bell rung, and because of that, it happened. That's why no one else had a problem with it. They understood. But have you seen guys deliberately do that ever? To fuck up the finish? They're working with someone they don't like, whatever it is, where they just don't kick out. They forget to kick out. They claim they forget to kick out, but they just didn't kick out. I think we'd have to think a long time to figure out the last time that a guy went into business for himself and changed the finish and he, he's the one that got beat. I can only think of Murdoch cause that was his rib and probably Carl Cox where he got it from to someday if they were just one in that mood or in a town, they didn't want to fucking be in or whatever, but they would grab the opponent, even if it was a job guy and just fucking small package themselves with the guy and cinch up where the guy couldn't let him go and beat themselves and get up and cuss him. What the fuck are you doing, you double-crossing motherfucker? You know, it made me think of Buddy Landell because of the Sonny King thing. And then I actually did want to mention to you, I saw the footage recently, someone tweeted, you retweeted it, of the angle from right before the dog left. Yes. With the dog and Hercules and Sonny King runs in the ring. Every single thing he does, he botches. Yes. It just, it was all over the place. You, and you didn't know, it, it either, you didn't know it was coming, you didn't know what was coming, or it looked like shit, and you didn't know how to sell it. And it was just, he was incredibly hard to work with, and Buddy was not only, not the most patient young man, it was trying to get over in a goddamn territory where everybody knew that you know, Sonny was not going to draw any money at that point once we'd seen him. And Buddy just had l less patience than anybody else for it. But good Lord, it was ugly. It was ugly. I told you that one time. Sonny King versus Hercules Hernandez. Now, all due respect to Sonny King, uh, who had a boxing background and was six foot three or four and two forty something and fifty or whatever in his day but he was in his mid forties and had had open heart surgery. And he's in there with Hercules Hernandez, who looks like he ate Mr. Universe and Jack to the gills and fuck a giant 285 pounds, 2% body fat. And they're trying to have a match and Herc's trying to sell for him. And it was just ugly, but Biloxi, Mississippi, the referee comes around and says, Pull Sonny's leg to start the heat, right? Okay. And so I'm going to wait until Sonny King is doing something to Hercules and hits the ropes. Either he's got a headlock, he gets shot off. What? But no, instead, because, and by the way, Sonny's calling a match because 
what's he's the veteran, right? They're just humoring it. Hercules stops him and grabs him and arm whips him into my ropes. And I didn't trip him. Because why would I be fucking up my guy's <laughs> maneuver, right? right? Yeah, right. But when Sonny hit the ropes, even though I'm I'm five feet away on the floor, I didn't even reach for him. He goddamn did a slow ox baker crumble to the ground like somebody had tripped him. And then he looks over at me and gives me a look like death, like, what the fuck? Well, no, what the fuck? You've been in business 20 years. Why would I whip trip the man that my wrestler had just whipped into the ropes to give him a devastating clothesline or whatever? Oh, fuck, I got to save your ass. What sense does that make? Ah, fucking Biloxi. And, and then Roddy West came over and, and said, so did, why didn't you trip him? And I said, go, and I told him, I said, go tell him I did, didn't trip him because I, why would I fucking trip him in that context? If he'd had a headlock and Hercules had shot him off, that's a defensive maneuver to get out of a headlock. If I trip the guy and he goes down, then my guy can get on him. If he shot him in the ropes, he was going to drop kick him, and I tripped him, then my guy's up there six feet in the air kicking fucking oxygen. Yeah, makes no sense. But you, uh, said, you said something before about Sonny King calling the match because he was the veteran. You always hear as a mark, like me, that the heel calls the match. How true is that, and why is that? Well, it, it was true except when it wasn't. And now I think it's a combined effort for everybody to be able to remember this shit, you know, uh, that they, they sit down and go over for hours or have written out or have talked about on the phone for days or whatever. So they're all reminding each other. But in the tradition in the territories was that the heel called the match because that way the heel could control the tempo and the flow of the thing, the the heel, it, it, it's it's easier for the heel to be calling the match for the baby face to control the overall deal. And also, especially because in a lot of cases, the heel is doing more for getting the baby face over during his heat than maybe even the spots that he calls at the start of the match to shine the baby face. If the heel is kicking the shit out of the baby face, not giving him room to breathe, goozling him, keeping him down, you know, riding him, just not giving him hope spots, then he's just beating the shit out of this fucking guy. But if the heel is constantly having the baby face fight back or giving him hope spots or registering that the baby face, even while he's down, is more than the fucking heel gave him credit for, that subliminally gets the baby face over more, even, the you know, depending on what the finish is. So that was a thing. And then, but there's, there was exceptions to that, obviously. Um, if there was a wide disparity in experience, or if, if the baby face was the star and the heel was a, you know, preliminary guy, but a lot of... <laughs> Flair would get with George South sometimes on TV and say, you call it, whatever the fuck, right? Um, but it, And then also, it, Lawler in Memphis, even as a, especially as a baby face, was going to call the match because he was, as Nick Bockwinkle said one time, one of the most brilliant ring generals he'd ever been in the ring with. He just knew psychology, knew when to bring it up, when to take it down, when to shine the baby face, but when to cut him off, when to, as the baby face, when he should fire back and stay alive, the whole flow of the thing. And then timing on finishes. But nevertheless, so yeah, but with Hercules Hernandez at that point, it probably been in the business not even three full years. And, you know, he said, okay, Sonny, he's the, he's the fucking baby face. He can call the way that, I'm going to cut, we're going to cut him off, right? It's not like that this was shut up and let me talk. But it just, he was going with it, I guess, because at the time, Herc was kind of new, and also he's like, what the fuck? I don't care. Were there ever fights over who's calling a match? 
Um, it, every every once in a while, it's sort of like the fucking story I told you the time Ernie Ladd got. I think it was, well, it was it was Doctor Death in the corner, and said, "Just calm down and listen to me." <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just grabbed the. He turned his back on him, sandwiched him in the corner, grabbed the top rope, and. We're going to stay here until you calm down and listen to me. You know, every once in a while, somebody will pipe in with a suggestion. You know, I've, who's calling this match? Just hold on. But, you know, it doesn't generally, or it didn't generally escalate into any kind of violence in the ring. And, and you could tell when, when guys got on different pages, when, you know, and that's when the matches fell apart because they didn't like what was going on or didn't trust each other or whatever. And then that's when you got the Most of the time it didn't happen in the ring. It was in the locker room afterwards when you got those deals going on. Tojo Yamamoto and Dandy Jack Donovan in Louisville. They in just, Louisville. They, yeah. They just, you know, start going for each other's eyes because they're, you know, there was not a lot of cooperation. Well, what were we talking about? We were talking about uh, a, vari a variety of things from Damian Priest to Sonny King to heels calling the match. Yes. And and that was a. a and now there are no heels. I guess that's why <laughs> the match is up for grabs. Whoever wants it. Well, and, and that's, uh, you know, it's a collaboration now, but it, it, there was no there was no ability to sit down with your opponent in. 75% of the arenas, the way they were set up and the way that the promoters did business in most territories uh, to sit down and talk over your match. So you got the finish from the booker or the referee or the booker's assistant representative, whatever. And then you'd send, Oh yeah. Well tell him when I swing the fucking cleaver, make sure he ducks because I, I'm left-handed or whatever, anything that needed to be clarified to make sure everybody understood what was going on, they would they would hopefully carry the message back over the other side. And then you did it in the ring, but you, you called everything up to that point in the ring as it was going on, and you couldn't have, you know, both guys just doing shit back and forth at random, say, I'll do this now. Because that wouldn't have made any fucking sense. And even with a lot of tag teams, it, it, Dennis and Bobby, uh, the Midnight Express, when they first got together, Dennis was calling the match. And Dennis was kind of calling a lot of the stuff Bobby was doing. You know, because th that's the thing. If you're, if you're a good tag team, if I'm the heel... And I've just planted the fucking baby face and I turn around and tag my partner as he's getting in and I'm getting out. I'm either going to tell him what to do to that guy or what that guy's about to do to him. In other words, if the baby face is going to pop up during that switch and take an arm drag, the new heel coming in, then when I tag the, my partner, as he steps by me, I say arm drag. And he knows that the baby face is going to spin under him and boom and things like that. So you're calling for the other guy also. 